Hi, and welcome. I'm Steve Martorano, and this is The Behavioral Corner. You're invited to hang with us as we discuss the ways we live today, the choices we make, the things we do, and how they affect our health and well-being. So you're on the corner, The Behavioral Corner. Please, hang around a while. Hi, everybody. It's me again, Steve Martorano, a host and guide here on The Corner, The Behavioral Corner. We call this a podcast about everything because everything winds up affecting our behavioral health. Uh, it's all made possible by our underwriting partners at Retreat Behavioral Health. You'll find out more about them later on. October is National Mental Health Awareness Month. We have always take a look at mental health uh, throughout the year, but particular focus uh, on the issue at this point in time. And in a specific uh, area as well, we're going to take a look at uh, mental illness and how it impacts the workplace from close to the, both the employee and the employer uh, point of view. Our guest to that end, because we have great guests that run into us here on the Behavioral Corner, is uh, uh, Laura uh, Winans, right? Winans? Yep, Lauren Winans. Lauren Winans. She is the CEO uh, of uh, an HR consultant, principal HR consultant, a company called Next Level Benefits. They are an HR consulting, a human resources consulting company. Laura is the founder of Next, Le- uh, uh, Next Level, um, 20 years now experience in this. She has a broad range of uh, experience in the, the issue of employers and what they need to do and employee rights. And we're going to take a look at how those things intersect in the workplace, a very problematic thing. Lauren, thanks uh, for joining us. I know that was long-winded. You know, I'm guessing, and I mentioned this to you before we started recording, that one of the reasons I think people who need to get uh, mental health uh, treatment are hesitant to do so for fear of losing their jobs. Um, Do you agree or disagree with that? I agree with that. You know, I I do think that there are, um, you know, employees that run up a up against a couple of different roadblocks to care. Um, I think one of them is is job loss. I think another might just be the stigma around um, mental health. I know that we have made some significant strides to get to a place where there's less of a stigma, but still, you know, there are you know, there are people out there who are you know just don't want people to think differently of them um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. when they do seek help. Um, mm-hmm. So I think it's a combination of things, but absolutely, job loss definitely plays a factor. Yeah, the the uh, insurance uh, issue would be paramount. The fear of losing that, even if you wanted to get treatment. But you're right. The stigma still attaches no matter how much education goes on. um, uh, People still stop, particularly in in the workplace uh, situation. I have certain there's certain sympathy with a guy who's hiring, having to make a a decision about not so much. Well, can this person do the job? So we're going to get into uh, into all of that. Can we begin, Laura, though, with uh, uh, what what are the more common mental health disorders that show up in the workplace? Yeah, you know, and so first off, their employees don't necessarily have to disclose any type of mental health condition that they may have, um, you know, but those that do end up getting revealed either through an employee who is willing to share that information or maybe even just through um, you know, different situations that might arise, um, employee relations conversations, you know, maybe even some leaves of absence. I think the most common are typically, um, you know, depression, um, you know, some sort of chronic mental illness that might be hereditary and within their families. There's also substance abuse, um, and a variety, um, you know, of different chronic conditions that actually have a mental health component to them. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one that a lot of people don't think about is, Um, Just for example, thinking of of Crohn's disease, Crohn's disease is a really difficult uh, digestive um, gastroenterology uh, issue, Um, but it often comes with um, some mental health challenges because of the social anxiety that comes with um, having that condition and and being among family, friends and in public. Um, And so there's there's lots of different ways it can present itself. But I would say the most common um, that that employers are often privy to and and are seeing are directly related to um, depression and specific uh, chronic conditions. Yeah. Uh, Let's back up to that. Um, issue of what a a, a potential employee can withhold from uh, in a job interview. You say they're not compelled to say anything about their health. 
I mean, you don't, you're not required to it's, it's, it's your, um, health condition. Um, mm -hmm. it can be as private as you would like it to be. It can be as public as you would like it to be. And it's important, um, that you ensure that you are, um, keeping true to yourself during an interview, but you know, who you are and how you perform your job is not necessarily your condition or your diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important that employees don't necessarily feel compelled to share that information if they're not ready to share it. Mm -hmm. um, so there is no requirement around um, disclosing any sort of mental health um, condition or, or issue um, during an interview process or even post interview once you're already employed and with, with an employer. On the other side of that equation, what uh, governs the kinds of questions and a potential employer can ask someone about their yeah. mental health? Yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, I, I think there is such a fine line, particularly on the employer side. So really, you know, employers are, are not necessarily, re you know, really allowed to ask any medical questions or, um, you know, pose any um specific scenarios um, to an employee to see what the, their answers might be with the intention of kind of identifying some sort of medical history. Um, so it's really important for an employer to you know, respect that privacy um, and any sort of medical information that they do end up um, obtaining, not through a line of questioning, but just simply through a conversation that the employee wishes to disclose to them, they must be keeping that um, completely confidential. Um, there is, you know, a lot of different laws out there, um, you know, specifically around privacy that really prevent employers from asking specific questions. And then, of course, once they know some some type of, um, you know, medical condition information to not be spreading that um, amongst uh, the organization. So it's it's more regulated on the employer side, clearly, than it would be on the employee side. Are are employee are employers uh, governed by the uh, in in the in, in the uh, situation of mental health disorders? Are they guided by the law, the Americans with Disabilities Act? Yep, ADA um, and and also um, HIPAA. Um, you know, it's it's very important um, that employers um, you not only respect the privacy of their employees um, it, as it relates to mental health and or other medical conditions. But it's also important that employer um, you know, follow the letter of the law and, and are compliant um, as it relates to those types of, of laws. The Americans with Disabilities Act, um, you know, the ADA you know, essentially is, is helping to um, you know, give guidelines and regulations as it relates to what type of accommodations um, need to be provided uh, within the workplace, um, you know, what type of conditions do qualify as a disability, um, and uh, what type of protections are in place for employees. Um, and so employers, if they don't, if you don't know about ADA, you definitely need to read up because it's incredibly important to be compliant um, with, with ADA requirements. And employees should also be aware of, of what their, their rights are. Um, and I think it's important to, to better understand, um, you know, that, that your mental health um, is private until you decide to disclose it. And if you disclose it and you request accommodations accordingly, your employer is required to take those accommodation requests mm -hmm. seriously mm -hmm. and ultimately help you identify some solutions in the workplace. Most of us think of those, uh, of those accommodations that are mandated by law as being um, uh, of a kind of physical nature. Uh, someone who can't get up steps, uh, doesn't move around very well, mm -hmm. uh, has to be accommodated about that. It, it, it's uh, much different when the disability is a, a mental disorder. Okay. What, are, what, what kind of accommodations would some, you know, I go in, I have a, uh, I have a history of uh, depression. Uh, in, I don't know whether I, I admit this up front, but I certainly have had a period of time when I've missed work, uh, not so much that I think I couldn't do the job, but I have missed work, and I this becomes apparent to my employer. What kind of accommodations uh, is the employer required to make in a situation like that? 
Yeah. You know, I, I think it, it often starts, you know, the way these situations kind of evolve in, in the best case scenario is an employer is able to kind of approach um, the employee and just check in, you know, hey, how are you doing? Um, you know, I have noticed X, Y, Z. Um, and, you know, here's some resources for you if you'd like to leverage them. Um, you know, these resources could be things like an EAP program. It could be information um, about how to connect with a member of the HR team to have a more confidential conversation. It could be, um, you know, essentially, uh, you know, discussing if there's any uh things that the employer can be proactively doing to kind of help you perform at a higher level, um, you know, within the workplace. If you as an employee, um, you know, engage in that conversation and you can get to a place where, yeah, you know what, um, maybe I need to file for FMLA so that, um, you know, occasionally when I need some additional personal time during the week, I can take some, some unpaid time off. Um, it might be something simple as that. It might also be, you know, hey, I, you know, suffer from um, depression and some anxiety issues, and it it heightens itself around certain times of year, around the holidays, when I'm thinking a lot about family members that I've lost. Um, you know, I am going to need to work part time through the month of December. Are you able to accommodate that? Um, so it it kind of depends upon the situation, but I think it's important to note that. When an employee is requesting an accommodation um, related to a condition, a medical condition, a health condition that they have, the employer must look at the accommodation to determine, is it reasonable for us to be able to accommodate this individual's request and, or does it put undue hardship on our business in order to, you know, to accommodate. So if an employee is asking to maybe work a little less hours over the course of, you know, four weeks of a year, Mm -hmm. that's not undue hardship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that would mean that, you know, that is a, a request that can be made and can also be fulfilled. You know, now if an employee were to say, Hey, you know what, I, you know, my depression and anxiety is, is it, unpredictable. And there might be times of the year where I'm going to need to take several weeks off at a time. Um, you know, I think, the employer's, you know, response to that is going to ultimately be, well, hey, you can file for FMLA. That's well, I, FLMA. What FMLA is family medical leave. Ah, okay. You can apply for family medical leave to take care of your own serious medical uh, health condition or that mm -hmm. of a family member. Mm -hmm. um, but in its twelve weeks of protected leave, most employers in in the country are subject to right. this federal law. Not all, but most. And so, you know, the employer might say, hey, you got these 12 weeks you can use. But beyond that, we can't accommodate you just deciding that, that next week you're not going to be here. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a little bit of give and take and a little bit of acknowledgement that there is reasonable requests. And then there are not so <laughs> reasonable requests. And you kind of have to meet in the middle and really yeah. hash that out on an individual basis. And that's ultimately what the ADA Act, that's what it's ultimately saying is, each employee is an individual and you must treat each situation in an individual basis and determine if you can make an accommodation for an employee based upon what, what issues they might have. In, in the uh, instance where there is a dispute over whether that is doable, who uh, decides how to proceed? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it depends upon how, how, you know, far the um, the challenge or the complaint may go. Um, you know, sometimes there is, um, you know, an EEOC charge. So the EEOC may need to get involved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the situation may land itself in a court of law. So there might be, you know, some attorneys that are kind of battling through that. Um, you know, it also just might get to a place where, you know, it's it's escalated itself to executive leadership and or a board of directors um, and they weigh in. Um, but I would say nine times out of 10, most of these issues can be resolved um, between HR teams, um, you know, the direct supervisor of the employee and the employee. They can they can meet together and figure this thing out. Your your um, your consultancy next level benefits. Do you deal exclusively with employers or do you also uh work with people just looking for work? 
Um, so we we mainly work with employers. Our clients are typically um, HR teams and or business owners um, across the country that need some HR expertise. That's essentially what we sell. Our team is made up of um, uh, HR professionals with decades of experience. So we tend to work directly with HR teams to help them do good HR and tackle different projects in the HR field. Um, but we often um, interact with a lot of different employees as part of the different projects that we do. Um, so there's lots of feedback and information that we obtain. Um, but, you know, I, I prior to doing all of this consulting work, um, I was also, you know, working for many employers in an HR capacity. So I've had a lot of exposure to this topic. I've managed leaves of absence. I have um, granted accommodations. And, um, you know, I think most of the people on my team have also been in that, that situation. So we kind of have a unique perspective where we've lived it um, and now we can also consult on it. Um, and so it's a, uh, it's a good place to be because I have seen such great strides in this area, uh, you know, particularly over the last handful of years, but naturally, you know, over the last, you know, 20, 25 years, we've come a long way um, in terms of the accommodations that employers can um, fulfill um, and are more willing to fulfill than they probably yeah. ever have been. You, you find that that's the case in, in corporate America? They, they're, they're looking to accommodate? I do. I do. And, and it could just be my perspective. Um, but, you know, the, the interactions that I've had, particularly with my past employers, as well as my current clients, are that they are willing to go through this interactive process with each individual who may request an accommodation. Now, everyone has their own line, you know, to draw on the sand on what's reasonable and what's unreasonable. Um, but what I am seeing is there is more of an appetite, um, mainly probably because of compliance issues, wanting to be compliant, but there's definitely more of an appetite to have these conversations and make an attempt um, to, to accommodate an employee in a way that is meaningful to them. What happens when someone does lose their job as a result of a mental illness? Uh, I mean, first of all, is that is it is it just straight ahead the same as any other situation? If the job's not getting done, the employer, um, I, I guess, doesn't necessarily need a reason you're not doing the job. But it, are there are there barriers to someone being terminated because they have a mental illness? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it's. It's one of those things where, you know, if it's affecting performance significantly enough um, and, and an employer can document that as such, like say, for example, you know, an employee is not showing up on time, it's impacting the team that he works on, um, you know, maybe he's even working in a distribution center or running some sort of, you know, a, a machinery or a piece of equipment, um, and there's a you know a safety issue or there's you know danger involved. There's lots of different things that an employer can document as, hey, this is impacting performance, and for this and this alone, th this person needs to be fired. This person needs to be terminated. Needs to be separated. Um, but in the case where there aren't really clear um, performance issues and an employee believes they are terminated because their employer knows that they have a mental health issue that could be seen as retaliation. Okay. Um, and so that's got it. You've got to really walk a fine line. There. Yeah. Because there are situations uh, with regard to mental disorders in the workplace in life, but in the workplace mm -hmm. where the disorder can be manifest, you can see it. Yeah. Um, it may to some extent affect uh, the employee's uh, work, but it, in a larger sense, it's a disruption of the workplace. Mm -hmm. For, uh, look, I'm thinking specifically of bipolar disorder, where there are manic episodes that, the, and the person's personality can change dramatically. If someone is fired in a situation like that, do they have cause to? Uh... <sighs> If they first, they'd have to demonstrate that it was because of their bi Correct. bipolar disorder that they Correct. were fired. Correct. That yeah. that is really the burden of proof. Is, is that possible? Is that even possible to prove? I, I mean, I think it can be. I, you know, I, I think depending upon the situation, you know, you might be able as an employee to clearly articulate, hey, here, here's what happened that day. Here's what happened that week. Here's what happened, whatever. And 
Um, you know, I, I, I wasn't pulled aside. I wasn't, nothing, you know, was discussed with me. I did not have a performance improvement plan that I needed to go through. I wasn't put on a warning. I wasn't given any, you know, anything like that. I was just immediately fired without any explanation. Stop um, for a second and tell me about that process. In other yeah. words, it's not a summary sort of thing. Come in, you're gone. There is a process employers have to go through. So can you take us through that? Yeah, sure. So best practices um, are, you know, unless an employee is violating company policy um, or um, obviously and clearly putting other employees at risk. Mm -hmm. So that aside, you know, typically the, the best practices, um, you know, to, to really kind of give an employee um, feedback and guidance that they can then make behavioral changes um, to how they're acting within the workplace before you actually terminate them. It's basically, okay, let's call to their attention that they've made a mistake, that they can't be doing this anymore and give them an opportunity to bounce back from, from whatever occurred. Um, and usually it's a 30 day window, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, Hey, here's the situation. We can't have you doing that anymore. Here's what we want to see from you. And we're going to be monitoring that over the next 30 days. If you can't fulfill that within the next 30 days, we're going to need to fire you. Um, and so that is, that's more of a best practice, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to go down that way, particularly if let's say in this case of, of a bipolar individual, if they are putting other employees in the workplace at a safety risk or in danger in some way, shape or form, an employer doesn't have to wait 30 days to fire that individual. It could be immediate. Um, and it, it's really, yeah, does the employee have recourse? They probably do, but would they win in a court of law? More than likely that employer is gonna be able to fully articulate and be prepared to say, hey, you know, we don't care what their condition is, but here's what happened. Right, here's the results of it, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Uh, you know, lots of uh, uh, companies have uh, employee assistance programs, particularly with regard to substance abuse, um, um, alcohol substance abuse in particular. What, what level of support in general are employers uh, required to at least offer to an employee they see have problems? So there's not a ton out there in terms of like a federal requirement necessarily. But what a lot of employers do is they do offer these employee assistance programs. They're very minimal in terms of cost to the employer, but they can provide a lot of impact to an employee. And then also anytime you're offering, um, you know, health insurance, medical insurance, you are required to be providing at least a baseline minimal um, essential coverage, which does include mental health benefits mm -hmm. and mental health services. So if you're an employer that's offering uh, health insurance, you at least need to be covering mental health health services at, at some, in some way, shape, or form. And then the EAP program is really something that could be for all employees, even those that are not enrolled on a healthcare plan. They have access to licensed um, professionals that can help them through different mental health challenges that they're having. Are either one of those requirements? I mean, it's not a requirement to offer an EAP program, but I would say most employers do. Um, it's not, it is a requirement that if you offer health insurance, that mental health benefits are included because that's just part of the affordable care act, but you don't necessarily have to be offering benefits. So there's some loopholes into, in this logic. Um, but ultimately if, if, you know, I think employers who are coming from a good place and want to do right by their employees, you know, regardless of what they have to do, they will do what they need to do to kind of help people um, not only help to keep their workplace intact and their culture, um, one that people actually want to be there and work there, but also kind of helping employees if they are struggling, you know, that that's kind of, you know, the, the purpose of an HR team, right, um, is mm -hmm. really to kind of help employees as they need help and really kind of be facilitating that um, that care, that, that assistance um, between the employer and the employee. We're speaking with Laura Winans. She is the uh, CEO and uh, principal HR consultant for the company she founded, Next Level Benefits. Um, I'm so. I guess there was a time when HR was a pretty straightforward proposition, more uh, science than art. Checked a lot of boxes. Yeah. Send it off to the uh, to the boss and said, "Well, the interview went well at our end. How to go at your end?" And and we move on. 
I think now it's probably still that, but there's a little bit of art here that sometimes one wonders uh, isn't intended to dance around a- asking certain, well, we know they can ask certain questions, but I, I hate to use the word conceal, but sort of conceal the real reason someone doesn't get a job. Uh, how do we how do we make sure that's not going on? Is there any way of knowing whether this is an honest transaction that's going on here? I mean, unless on bo- by the way, on both sides, because the yeah, yeah. Your person can come in and want, and I'm not going to tell you about my mental health disorder. I'm not going to tell you about my meds or any of that stuff. And the HR person has to have an antenna up going, you know, what kind of a potential employee is this? Once you start down the road, of asking or, or, or getting to that uh, uh, nub question, then you've got a whole other set of problems. So how's that dance performed equitably? You know, it's, that's a really great question because I, I don't believe that there, it can be, um, you know, I think an employee naturally is going to come into an interview process with holding certain information, right? Well, best face forward, right? I mean, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. And, and vice versa, but also the employer is, is, you know, they know what their risks are. They know what the liability looks like when they say the wrong thing during an interview or when they, you know, uh, hire someone who may end up being more of a problem for them than than it is a benefit to have them in the in the business. So I don't know if it'll ever be an equitable exchange. I, I think that when you have both parties that that ultimately are trying to protect themselves in the exchange, you're not necessarily always going to get a hundred percent of of the truth of you know in the transaction. But I well, do me, think yeah, go ahead. No, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, you know, but I but I do think that there are ways and there are companies that do make an attempt um, to kind of tear down some of those barriers and some of those walls to have a more, you know, interactive, you know, informal exchange where they're very clear about what type of person they're looking for to work in, you know, in the company. They're very clear about what their culture is like. And, you know, I think employees have to be consumers when they're interviewing too, you know, Hey, I know what my condition is. Sure. If, if I get anxiety in small spaces, I'm not going to go into mining. Like I'm not going to go underneath the ground and do this job. So I think there's, you know, it's until we get to a place where, you know, there, there isn't so much risk on the employer side for making a poor choice in a hire. And there isn't so much stigma on the employee side for sharing who they are and maybe what conditions they might have until we get to a place where both parties feel completely comfortable. I don't think there's yeah. an equitable yeah. exchange yeah. there. Yeah. And that, well, it's an honest answer for sure. And, and the uh, condition you, you just described of equilibrium is, is uh, the, the only way that happens is with better mental health care. Exactly. <laughs> we we've need, got a challenge there. <laughs> and we've and we've got we've got a mental health crisis. Right. And and uh, you know we're 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 running just to uh, you know stay in place. Um, but that process, the the whole the whole, I'm trying to get a job. I'll be. I'll ask you another question. I'll ask you to be brutally honest, and I'm sure you mm-hmm. will be. As an as a potential employee, I'm coming in for my interview. Uh, do you know? Do I at some point just? By the way, I have a history of whatever depression, bipolar. Doesn't that sort of doesn't that sort of knock them out of the job right away? Because the person taking the interview uh, is not going to have any time to determine in that exchange whether how, whether this is de- debilitating or would involve them not being able to do the job. So it's a there's an ince- almost an automatic incentive on the part of the employee to not say anything. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree. I, I would agree that there isn't a lot of upside for the employee other than if the employee wants to be working at a place where they're supported and they can be them, their full selves every single day and not have to hide maybe something that right. they have to struggle or deal with. 
Um, so I would say, yeah, it, it's not it's not necessarily going to be advantageous to you as an employee to bring sure. it forward. But if you want to ensure that you're working at the right place, you're working for the right people and that you can work at this you know, company or this organization for the long haul, saying that sort of thing and seeing what type of response you get isn't the worst thing in the world. Yeah, I hear it's going to help you kind of eliminate, you know, some of these 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 positions, these options, these companies. And you kind of know pretty quickly whether or not you want to work for them. So it's there's a, it's a double edged sword. But no, I, I I don't. There isn't a lot of upside to yeah. Just that. There isn't right. Um, and I guess it's also uh, self evident that if you do have a mental disorder, while you may not put it at the top of the resume, uh, if you get the job and your disorder begins to affect you, you then should be the first person to say, "Hey, look." I've I've suffered from this. Would you agree? That that's agree. the way you should uh, approach that. I agree. You you definitely um, if you feel that your condition is impacting your performance or your attendance in any way, it 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 is beneficial to disclose at least some you know level of insight into what your condition may be. You don't even have to tell like say the actual name, but just by saying I have a condition mm -hmm. that prevents me from being a hundred percent every single day. Um, you know, just by disclosing that, that is helpful because now the employer's on notice that you are dealing with something. And there are some rights and there are some rights to exactly. accrue if you're upfront about it. Yeah, that's, that's exactly. great. That's great. Great advice. Um, Lauren, there's a whole lot more about this. It's such a real world problem. The world is changing as we know, um, <laughs> so swiftly, nowhere more so than in the workplace. The pandemic disrupted everything we thought we knew about work. Artificial intelligence is going to shake up uh, oh, the yeah. situation. HR is going to become, uh, I guess, more difficult, and more important going forward, uh, forward than ever. I agree completely. I mean, there's just there's there's so many different ways that work is going to continue to change and the workplace is going to continue to change. And I think HR professionals and, um, you know, the employers that they serve are in a really um, you know, interesting predicament. They're going to not only going to need to continue to maintain their bottom lines, but they're also going to need to continue to, to compete for talent. And it's going to be harder and harder to do that, especially as AI is going to be in the mix. And we're going to naturally see a lot of changes in, in you know, society. It's going to be um, a wild ride. So I'm excited to be an HR consultant. It's a good mm -hmm. time for us. Yeah. Just uh, leave us with this last uh, thing. Uh, there, there was a time, perhaps not so very long ago, when a mental health disorder of any sort just shut the door on you getting into a, a situation of the workplace that you might that you might desire, that that is changing, in your view. It is. It is. I mean, us having the, this conversation today is something that wouldn't have happened even maybe five seven, eight years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. the fact that we're able to have this conversation and the fact that you know, employers are more willing than ever um, to find ways to uh, assist empl employees with their mental health is, um, I mean, we're light years away from where we used to be. So yes, I do see steps in the right direction, um, strides that are being taken that are going to, you know, ultimately impact the workplace, um, you know, more, more widely than it already has been. But it's going to take some time, like like yeah, anything does. Like everything else. Laura Winans, thank you so much, uh, CEO. Uh, Next Level Benefits. We'll have a link for her. Uh, so if you want more information about her company, you can catch us. And we thank you for uh, your time here on The Corner. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. We thank you all as well. Uh, don't forget, like us, follow us, critique us. Whatever you do, we're uh, we're wherever you find your podcast, the Behavioral Corner. See you next time. Bye bye. Retreat Behavioral Health has proudly been serving the community for over ten years. Here at Retreat, we believe in the power of connection and quality care. We offer comprehensive, holistic, and compassionate treatment from industry leading experts. Call eight five five eight zero two. 6600 or visit us at www.retreatbehavioralhealth.com to begin your journey today.
that's it for now. And make us a habit, hanging out at the Behavioral Corner. And when we're not hanging, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, on the Behavioral Corner.